Welcome everyone who is joining in the audience and at home. My name is Jody Anderson. I'm a member of LWV, Anoka, Blaine, Coon Rapids, and our members are from the Northwest me Metro area. That means Andover, Anoka, Blaine, Champlin, Coon Rapids, and Ramsey, and more. My co-host is the League of Women Voters, Minnesota President Laura Helmer. This event is in partnership with the State League of Women Voters along with the St. Paul Neighborhood Network. Today's event is part of the League of Women Voters series on the roles of constitutional officers. On January 12th, we interviewed Professor Jason Marisam from Mitchell Hamlin College of Law, who provided background on the constitutional roles of the Secretary of State, State Auditor, and Attorney General. Today, I would like to introduce our guest, Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison. He is a longtime elected official, having served in the Minnesota Legislature and the U.S. House of Representatives. Mr. Ellison was first sworn in as Minnesota's 30th Attorney General on January 7, 2019, and was reelected this past year. Today, we'll start by giving Mr. Ellison time to speak about his work and the responsibilities of his office. Later, we will ask a few questions. If anyone in the audience would like to submit a question, just write it down on the index card and Amy will pick it up. Mr. Ellison, we are honored and to have you here today and I'll turn it over to you. Well, the honor is all mine and I am a massive fan of the work of the League of Women Voters. And I wanna thank you all for inviting me here today, but also for the decades and decades of work that you have done to empower Minnesotans both men and women, but especially women, because we do know that uh, you know we live in a society that has historically uh, not a, not allowed women to fully participate in society. And there's so many issues and examples to prove that. So League of Women Voters becomes this champion organization, which says, no, we're going to elevate the voice to make sure that we have all voices heard in our in our state, our country. So th hats off to y'all, and thank you so much. So as Attorney General, I. Uh, I, I believe that my job is to help people afford their lives and live with dignity, safety, and respect. Um, the Attorney General's office is a constitutional office. Uh, it goes, it's written in our Minnesota Constitution. Every state has a t Attorney General. 43 states elect their Attorney General. And uh, about 48 states, uh, the Attorney General serves at the pleasure of the people, not the governor. Now, there are a few states that are where the governor appoints, just like our federal government. Our federal government actually has a structure that is in the minority of states. Because in the federal government, the president appoints the attorney general and is confirmed by the Senate. And that only happens in Wyoming, New Jersey, uh, and, uh, in, and in Rhode Island. Uh, Maine is unique because the legislature picks the attorney general which is kind of weird, but for most, we're elected and answerable to the people. So I work with the governor, I work with the Secretary of State, and I represent them, I'm their lawyer, I represent the state legislature, I represent over 100 boards, commissions, and state agencies, and I also represent the people. Now, you might wonder, what's the difference between representing the state apparatus and the people? Well, when I, so for example, when I sue uh, or when Hubert H. Humphrey sued the tobacco companies. He was suing on your behalf. When you elect him to be the, when he elected Hubert H. Humphrey to be the, be the Attorney General, you empowered him to say, if anybody is ripping off Minnesotans, the Attorney General can sue on behalf of Minnesotans. And so we have cases right on up till this very minute. Um, you know, Exxon Mobil, Jewel, the vaping company, and I can name 20 more where we have said we believe you've been unfair, you've used, you violated the statutes of our state, and we're gonna hold you accountable for it. On the other hand, there are occasions when I'm defending the actions of the state apparatus, right? So if somebody sues the Department of Corrections, my office defends them in court. Uh, same with everything else. We also staff a lot of boards and agencies, so like the Board of Medical Licensing. You're, if you have a medical professional or provider, that you feel is not living up to professional standards, it would be my office that would bring these issues to the board and argue that there might be either, there might be some license issues. 
for, for that particular provider. But the same when it comes to education, same when it comes to even barbers and cosmetologists and a whole bunch of others as well. So, and then the other thing I do is I sit on a few boards that I really want people to know about. One of them is the pardon board. And me and the governor and the Chief Justice Gilday, we sit about once, twice a year, may, and, and we listen to people who've made petitions to get pardons or commutations. And we just finished one in, in December where we take two straight days and just listen to people's cases where they ask for pardons. Some get them, some don't. And then I'm on the board of the State Board of Public Investment, and this is the board that supervises the pensions of state employees. And uh, like, there's a whole lot of money flowing through there, and I gotta honestly tell you that I need the pro help of the financial professionals to, to, to do that work, but it is ultimately me and the governor and the Secretary of State and the State Auditor and the Lieutenant Governor who sit on that. And uh, we, um, it's our job to, to make sure that the pensioners have enough money to retire. And there's a disproportionate number of women who earn a living from the work that they did uh, throughout their productive lives. So that's very important. So uh, that's, what, that's what I do and uh, that's what my job responsibilities are. And um, I love doing the work. I love doing public service. I used to be in the private, was in the private sector. I was in the nonprofit sector. I've been in the governance sector. And I guess that means I'm getting up in age, but, um, <laughs> but I've, 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 I've had fun doing it. Wow, thanks so much for that introduction. I know I learned a few things that I didn't know before. Um, now we'd like to ask you some questions that we've prepared. <clears throat> they were submitted online by members and also then curated by our league leadership. You're only gonna ask me the easy ones, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer the hard ones. Uh -oh. <laughs> it's a team, team uh, approach. Team up, team up. <laughs> We're good team. I think an easy one to start out with. Uh, what are your priorities for the next four years? Right. So my main priority is helping Minnesotans afford their lives and live with dignity, safety, and respect. What do I mean by that? Here's what I mean by that. If you cannot afford your insulin and you have to cut dosage or skip days, then you can't afford your life because without that insulin, you're not going to make it. So what we do is we prioritize things that Minnesotans need to survive and we stand with them to make sure that they can. So we've prioritized things like housing. Historically, the Attorney General didn't do much in the area of housing. Now we do a lot more because we understand housing is expensive, precious commodity, and if people don't have it, it is exceedingly difficult to survive. So we have taken up cases in North Minneapolis where we, st where we sued a landlord where there were 267 families. We, we, took, we sued a, a, a landlord in southern Minnesota where there were 800 uh, units. We're, 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 we're doing work when it comes to manufactured housing. Some people call it mobile home parks, but they're not mobile, right? So we did them in Northfield, we did them, we're doing them in, in, in southern Minnesota, and we're doing them really all over the state. So we're trying to say the people have to have a right to live in safe, decent uh, uh, places. And so we're standing next to the folks and we're doing a lot on that. We're also doing things on wage theft because how can you afford your life if you can't even get the money that you worked for? So we're filing a lot of lawsuits on that. And we're not just looking at the typical wage theft cases. We're looking at some in the gig economy. Like we just sued, sued Shipped, which is a, uh, it's like a, it's like a, it's like the Uber for, for shopping, right? And we sued them because we felt like they were violating the law and being very unfair to some of their drivers and shoppers. Um, and so that's the area of wage theft. So we want to make sure that people get the pay that they've, they've earned. And then just consumer, just general consumer law. We, a lot of things come through the door. So for example, um, people who, uh, there were some folks who bought in-ground pools and the people collected the money and then ran away with the money and didn't do the pool. So we found them, we sued them. Same thing with solar panels. And there's just a lot of cases like that. The overall idea being, you must get value for the things that you pay for, and it's not okay for businesses to deceive and lie. And uh, there, and, most, and I just want to say, most landlords, most employers, most most uh, businesses are very honest. But when they're not, there's got to be somebody who says ah ah ah, and that's us. And so that's what we do. We also help people afford their lives by representing ratepayers. That's you and me. When it comes to utility bills. 
So we have a group called the Residential Utilities Group. And you may recall a few years ago when they had that massive spike in energy prices in Texas. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Well, we argued to the Public Utilities Commission that the utility companies that provide us with energy, they should have known it. They should have bought futures in, to lock the price in as opposed to buying it on the spot market when it's super high. And because there were, th this was not a surprise. There was a lot of reasons to believe that, you know, there was going to, weather reports tell you things are going to get really cold in the next few days. And so they did, but they didn't take the action they should have taken. Therefore, they shouldn't be able to just charge back all that money to the consumer. So we, we fought that on that front as well. And so, you know, that's our, that's our job. So we are, we're, so what are my priorities? Help people afford their lives, housing, wages, medical debt, me pharmaceutical drug prices. Uh, what else are our priorities? Um, student loan debt. We've sued Navient. We've sued Minnesota College of Business and Globe College, Argosy, others to make sure that, that they are being s fair with students. And we also keep our eye out on senior scams because we know a lot of seniors are often targeted because you know, I mean, you know, uh, they take advantage of the seniors who are lonely. They take advantage of seniors who don't hear that well, who, who might not be able to. And they know seniors tend to have more money than others because they've worked for a lifetime. Right. Yeah. So there are folks who do nothing but figure out how to separate grandma from her money. And sometimes they're family members, mm -hmm. which is really hard, but it's true. We also have a responsibility to help do public safety. We have a unique defined role when it comes to criminal prosecution. As you know, we have 87 county attorneys and they do a good job. But about half of our county attorneys only have three lawyers in the whole office. So if there's a murder in say Brown County, Morrison County, Lake Lockwood County, they are able to call us and say, we haven't seen anything like this in six years. Can you guys come help us? And we do those. And we've done over 33 of them uh, in, the, in the last few years and we're gonna get money to do more. So, you know, uh, nothing can be more devastating to a community and a family than having one of their loved ones murdered. There's got to be accountability and we prosecute those cases. But we do it within the Constitution and we do it fairly. Because we don't, you know, we, we don't believe, we believe that even the defendants have rights and we observe, we make sure that we observe those and we still convict the people who commit these heinous acts. Yeah. So that's what we're doing. We're doing a lot on the, um, on the front of the opioid crisis. Uh, we, we got back about $300 million just, uh, just back a few months ago. We got another one coming through, settlement coming through with $235 million. Wow. Now, this money is not going to the Attorney General's office. All the money that we, w that we fight for and win back for Minnesotans, we don't get it. It goes to the general fund. Mm -hmm. Except for opioid money, it goes to a special account that the legislature set up. And that money, so 75% of it goes to our local counties. Because where is the addiction happening? It's happening in Ely, it's happening in Zambroda, it's happening in North Minneapolis. It's not happening at the Capitol. <laughs> so the money should go where the pain is mm -hmm. to help people get well, to get over the addictions, to make sure that people can restore their lives again. Mm -hmm. So this is what we do every day and uh, I, I'm so honored to do the work. What a great list of priorities. Well, um, also, you did a great job of answering some of the questions we have teed up for you coming right. up too, but right. what I didn't hear yet, um, and I'm wondering about what will the Attorney General Office do over the next four years to ensure racial justice? Well, this is a very important question. And I, and you know, you can just count on the League of Women Voters to always try to make our country a better, more inclusive place. So I'm not surprised you'd ask me that. And let me just say, it's in the feminist tradition or the women's rights tradition. I mean, way back in the day, people may not know that, uh, you know, there were a lot of uh, early suffragettes who were on the front line who were fighting for racial justice, even back in the day. I'm talking 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago. So this is so, so let me just say what the, the Attorney General's office, we, we should always be making sure that we are uh, working toward this, th this just society. I mean, yesterday, two days ago was Martin Luther King Day. It's a reminder that this is all of our responsibility. What, what I've done uh, is we have, first of all, worked in the area of dealing with hate crimes. So we've pushed legislation and advocated legislation to make sure that police prosecutors can investigate hate crimes more effectively that, to make sure that nobody is harassed because of you know, who they are. You'll remember a few years ago, there was a spike in anti-Asian hate crime. Well, we, we did a tour around the country, to, around the state, 
to make sure that we were discussing this issue. My message to people was, by the time it gets to a police or a prosecutor, it's almost too late. We need to have our communities discussing these things, making sure we have a high standard for tolerance and inclusion of everyone so that we can put, we can make it not okay to be, be involved in this kind of bad activity. The other thing that we do with the Attorney General's Office to make sure we have a more just society is we, we've set up um, an expungement clinic. As you well know, after the 13th Amendment was passed, it said nobody can be involved in involuntary servitude unless they're convicted of a crime. And then so at that time we saw the racialization of crime, right? Okay. And, and, and so we know that there's a lot of people who have excessive um, records that probably if they were not who they were, they wouldn't have them, even if they, even if they acted the same way. And so we're we set up a statewide expungement program to help people restore their records so that they can work and so that they can go and, and, and uh, lead their lives more productively. And there's a whole lot more things I could talk about, but I'm so glad you asked that question. I think it's all of our responsibility. We will be better off and more, uh, we, we're a more democratic society than we've ever been in the history of our country, but we still got plenty of long ways to go. I get to ask the next question. It's kind of out there, but guns drawn and shootings in public oh, yeah. spaces like the Mall of America oh, and yeah. Northtown Mall yep. are alarming and common now. Yes, there are significant concerns about excess guns in our society. I agree. What role is your office actively taking to ensure gun violence is being addressed? And what, if any, legislation do you see enacted to address this concern? Can you please tell us what legislation is about ghost guns, too? Yeah. This is essentially kits that can be put together at home. Right. So a ghost gun is basically like buying a car that doesn't have the wheels on it. Right. Uh, and then the wheels are right next to it. Mm -hmm. So if you just assemble it, they can sell it as not a car if the car doesn't have wheels on it. Well, so they sell you a gun, a gun kit, so you snap a few things on, now you got your gun, but it's sold set with the parts separated. That's what it is. We, uh, I joined with other uh, attorneys general to say, look, there cannot be any, to, to put, come up with a rule from the Biden administration that said you cannot sell any parts of a gun that don't have a serial number on them because the real danger of a ghost gun is you can't trace them. Now, one of the things that we're doing at the attorney general's office, we filed a lawsuit against a gun retailer who we believe, we allege, was, is negligently selling guns. You can sell guns uh, in America. Everybody knows that. But you can't negligently sell them. You can't sell them to someone where you don't check everything you're supposed to check and you just let anybody walk in and walk out with like a whole bunch of guns. And if somebody, the same person, is buying dozens and dozens of guns in a very short period of time, that's a clue that this person is not buying them for personal use, but they're trafficking in guns to who? People who are illegal, illegally obtaining them. This is called a straw purchaser. So we sued Fleet Farm because we can show that they were selling to a straw purchaser. They should have known better based on basic checks that they were supposed to do that they didn't do. And that those guns were used in crimes, including, a, including uh, in the truck stop uh, shooting that occurred about a year ago last September, where uh, a very, very uh, promising young woman, 26 years old, she was a veterinary technician, and she was shot down and killed. And one of the guns that was found on the scene was from Fleet Farm. And then there was another case where a six-year-old kid found one of them in the bushes. And this little 16-year-old, this little six-year-old guy, he saw this gun, he touched it, and it was really heavy. So he went to tell his father about it, and his father got the gun, and they turned it over to law enforcement. And I said to his father, I'm glad he was six as opposed to 16. Because if he was 16, he might have thought, ooh, look at this cool thing I have. Whereas the six-year-old probably gonna mind mom and dad a little bit better. But let me just tell you this, um, about 341 people, 341 people are shot in America every day. Did you think I just said week? I said day. 340 some people are shot a day across our country. Maybe 111 of them die. Maybe 210 of them don't die from their wounds. Um, about 41 of them are murders. Uh, the guns are worse, because, not just because of ghost guns, but because also something called switches. What is switch? Switch is, means that you can put a little 
adjustment to the gun that will make it fire uh, like a like a machine gun. So some of the so we, we prosecuted a guy in Albert Lee who shot off 80 rounds, actually shot a police officer, uh, but the officer had on a protective vest, which probably saved his life. So guns are a real problem. We're pro we're and I'm just going to say this: we're when we find negligent retail retail sales to straw purchasers, we're going to sue the companies that do that. And I just want any company out there listening to know: check it, check it twice, follow the rules, or we're going to sue you. Do you keep, do you keep track of all of the data on all of the uh, all the records and everything? Do you keep track of that? Well, I personally make it my business to. To, to know as much about it as I can, mm -hmm. but uh, we rely on you know different pl partners in this in, out there you know um, you know groups like uh, the ATF have the information. A lot of this information is, is just available, mm -hmm. but I mean the proliferation of guns. And I just want everybody listening to know I'm not some anti-gun person. I own guns myself. You know uh, there's I don't think there's but but look you lock you lock up your guns. You put them in a locker or you put a gun lock on them. You don't buy a gun and then just put it under the seat of your car because somebody could easily steal that gun. You, um, you make sure that, uh, that your loved ones who go buy a gun, that they're not despondent and like thinking about ending it all because one of the number one ways of people kill, people die from guns is suicide. And then, and then of course, you know, you have the, the domestic violence problem. You know, we need red flag laws. So that you know, a lot of women are killed by their partners when the when they when the breakup happens or when the police are called. Uh, and like I said, a lot of kids kill themselves accidentally with guns because they're messing with dad or mom's gun and they don't know how to really operate it, and they make a mistake and they kill themselves or a little friend. So there, th this issue is uh, tragic, and you, you know, the, the, I don't have to tell the legal women voters because you all know very well. But we need better gun laws. Mm -hmm. There is there is no reason. I mean, look, you can, guns are privately owned in Canada. They don't have the same problem we have. Japan doesn't, they have like, like, you, the, the number of shooting deaths in Japan, you can count on one or two hands in a year. Europe doesn't have these kind of problems. Australia, which is a gun-owning society, doesn't have these kind of problems. Only us, and it's not really the right to bear arms, it's the right to sell arms. And some people just make a lot of money doing it, so they do it. And uh, I just think that it's time for us to have sensible gun laws. And I'm going to stand for that. I'm going to change the direction a little bit. Okay. Account, I guess political campaigns are becoming increasingly places where inflammatory lies and threats are a concern. What type of action, if any, would your office to do to curb this dangerous speech? Do you see any legislation or local as well as national that would help curb or prosecute the behavior? Well, you know, we do have a First Amendment which says people have the right to free expression. But that doesn't, but there's still, there's still uh, walls around that. Mm -hmm. You can't shout fire in a crowded theater, for example, unless there is a fire, then you can. But, but you know, in po our political speech, I mean, look at George Santos. He didn't do it, set, threaten anything dangerous. But the man is one of the most prolific liars you can possibly ever imagine, and yet he got elected. What I'm saying is that we live in a time when I just hope voters, I don't care if you are the most conservative Republican or the most liberal Democrat, I don't care who you might be, we have to insist on honesty and truth. And if a politician says something wrong, they should say that what I said was incorrect, here's what's right. And they should never intentionally say anything wrong. Uh, you know, we, look, our First Amendment is a blessing. It sometimes can be a curse. I think we might need more robust um, uh, campaign finance laws that say, look, if you're making material misstatements, that's not going to be all right. You know, um, and we need a more active press. Here's the other thing. Pe politicians used to be scared to get up and tell big lies because the press would get them. Well, now we live in an age where newsrooms have gotten smaller, online crazy has gotten bigger, um, and I think we should subsidize more newspapers and press 
whose job it is is to advance truth in the public interest as opposed to just, you know, push one agenda or another. You know, in, in, in England, you know, they, they, in the UK, they, 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 they support a, 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 the public broadcasting, public press, things like that, because sure, it's fine to have the private press because people have a right to have their opinion, but there should be something that you turn on that TV and you have some sense that that's probably true. Whereas now, we don't have that. Uh, and um, again, uh, a lot of jokes have been made about George Santos and the stories he tells, but I think he's a metaphor for the times we live in. And we ought to just ask ourselves, if this can happen, if somebody this prolifically dishonest can get elected, then did, don't we need more? Maybe we don't need to stop him from speaking, but we, speaking, but we need other ways to to fact check him so that the public really knows the truth. Those, that's the best I got. As Attorney General, I gotta admit, I don't have any, I don't have any big tools for that. I, you know, let's deal with something simple like, uh, like, gun, like guns and stuff like that. You know, but the lies out there, those are tough. They are. Yeah. Um, earlier you spoke about your working relationship between your office and the county attorneys statewide. Yep. And I'd like to go just a little bit deeper with that. Please. I've got um, three questions for you to think about. What is the AG's role in prosecuting criminals who are charged at the county level? Right. Does the AG have discretion in deciding to prosecute a case, or does the county have to request that help? And if a county chooses not to prosecute a crime, would your office step in and take over? And maybe you've got some examples you could share. Yeah, let me tell you. So under Minnesota Statute 8.01, and I know that, you know, my, my communication staff says, Keith, never tell people numbers and stuff. People don't remember that. But I'll just say 8.01, 8.01. If you look it up under Minnesota Statute 8.01, the Attorney General uh, may take a case if asked by the, by the county attorney or if appointed by the governor. The governor does, can just say, this is your case. The county attorney can ask but what I cannot do is just take. I don't have any legal authority to say, that case, it's now my case. Now, if there is a crime which is clearly, uh, uh, there's a victim and somebody has suffered because of wrongdoing, I could call the county attorney and say, do you need my help? They can say yes or they can say no. If they say no, I could call the governor and say, would you appoint me to this because this is really wrong and we can't let this person get away with that. Um, I could do that. I've never had to do that. I've never done it. I've never had to do it. I hope I never have to do it. Um, but I, do, I will tell you, I can't get specific, but I heard very recently uh, of, a, of a tragic situation where you know a local person was saying that I wish the county attorney was doing more. So uh, I can't get into any specifics. I'll just say this. Behind the scenes, I called up the person and said, hey, what's going on with that? Do you need any help? So often things are done with telephone calls, not everything. You don't have to embarrass people all the time. But uh, I will tell you that I, if, 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 a, if a crime happened, that it was clear to me that this was an injustice that happened to a person uh, and, 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 the local, and the county attorney wasn't acting, um, I would I would make it clear to them that I'm there to help, and if they're like, we got it, uh, we're not prosecuting this because we don't want to. If it was bad enough, and if the family and the community wanted me to, I might seek seek I might ask the governor to appoint me, but um, the key wouldn't have to. And so that's kind of how it works. There, you know, uh, I'll tell you that you know the way it's set up now is that uh, the county attorneys are elected to prosecute crimes, and I can tell you honestly, they do a great job. I'm so proud of our county attorneys in Minnesota. They do a fine job. But sometimes you need, but you need sometimes to, you need some, some other ways to get things done and they're there if we need to. But I will say this, there is one exception and that is in the area of Medicaid fraud. Medicaid, if Medicaid fraud happens, we, I don't have to ask anybody, I can just prosecute those cases. Yeah. 
Great. There's a question that came from the audience that is sort of the opposite of this, the opposite of the Attorney General's office stepping in to help somewhere. This is a case that was yours, um, the George Floyd case. Um, your office brought in outside prosecutors for the trials resulting from the George, George Floyd murder. Was this a one-time event, or are you open to similarly bringing in outsiders to prosecute unique cases? Um, I'll say that it is a rare event, and I did it because um, I thought this case was so important, I needed to get the very best people I could find. And um, my staff attorneys are great, very, very good. But there was some complicated medical stuff in this case, in the Floyd case. As you recall, we all watched the video and, you know, a 99 you know, 999 people out of a thousand would say that it's clear that the knee on the neck is what killed him. But, you know, somebody might say, oh, no, he was dying anyway, fentanyl, blah, 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 blah. And I've heard people say that, which I think is ridiculous. But we had to make sure that we nailed that down. So I got some folks who uh, I knew could help me with the complex medical stuff. We also, uh, at that time, had not ever prosecuted any members of former members of law enforcement because I've never prosecuted a police officer. Everybody I've prosecuted has already been fired by their department, mm -hmm. right? But uh, we've never had a situation where we prosecuted someone who formerly was an officer. So uh, I did consult with a friend of mine who had done that as a member of the United States Department of Justice when he was in that unit that does that. And so uh, those folks, and so they came in to help and uh, Quite honestly, it ended up uh, working out pretty well. But I would, I, I'm not close to it. It's not, but I don't do it because we really, because quite honestly, um, our criminal group has gotten a lot of experience, uh, a lot more experience. You know, we've, we've already had a lot, but we got a whole lot more, sadly, because bad things happen. And um, so now, you know, we've done, we've done a lot of cases of official misconduct. We've done a lot of murder cases, and I would put our team up against anybody in terms of dealing with certainly homicide. Now a couple of questions about the AG office and staff. Uh, the staff of the Attorney General represents state agencies in enforcement of laws. True. How many assistant AGs are working, and is this staffing level sufficient to meet the agency's needs? And then how do you prioritize areas of focus and hiring of staff? Right, so we have about 340 people total working at the Attorney General's office. About 150 of those people are lawyers. The rest are investigators, mediators, uh, and people who work as support staff. Uh, as you know, you show me one lawyer, you probably, that person probably needs a paralegal or a legal secretary, it's just, it's just not one person. And so uh, that's sort of the numbers. Um, you know, how do we prioritize hiring? Well. We, we, we advertise uh, openings and uh, we do through, go through a series of interviews and we hire the best person. And I can tell you, I'm 59 now and I've been doing hirings since I was 29 and I can tell you that hiring anybody is a gamble. Sometimes you get people you thought they interview really well and they don't work out. And some people interview badly and they're superb, <laughs> but you hire the best person you can and uh, you know, and support them and train them and ho hopefully it works out and it almost always does. Yeah? Uh, you kind of touched on this question. Tell us how you decide to bring lawsuits against corporations, insurers, on behalf of Minnesota consumers. Right, so it usually starts with complaints. complaints. Yeah, it usually starts with complaints. So uh, can I give a number out? So. Anybody watching, write this number down. This is a very important number. 651-296-3353. 651-296-3353. So I'll give you an example. So like, let's say you uh, have a knock on your door and somebody says, wouldn't you like to get solar panels on your house for the low price of blah, 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 blah. We'll sell you these solar panels and let me tell you right away, you're gonna be saving money and it's gonna be awesome. Just sign right here on the dotted line. And you're like, oh, that sounds okay. So you sign up. Next thing you know, you're getting bills for these solar panels and they're not even working. And so you're spending more, but you're not getting any reduction in your energy bills. And you're like, oh no, what do I do? So then you start calling them and they don't answer. 
You call some more and they don't answer some more. So then you ask around, you tell a friend, they say, you should call the Attorney General at 651-296-3353 and we'll answer and we'll take those car calls and we usually will, we'll, my staff will write up the complaint and we get, if we get one of them, we'll, just, we'll try to call the, if the people in our consumer action group, we'll try to call the company and say, hey, there's a problem. And usually the, we, we work a lot of cases out like that. And uh, by the way, we've gotten 52,000 calls last year. And mm -hmm, 52,000 calls. And, uh, and, and so, but let's, but let's say you get more than one call, two, three, four, five calls. Now we got a frequent flyer. And I, and look, I'm not uh, here to criticize anybody, but I'll say that there's some companies, quite honestly, the companies that you know in our household names, where we get a lot of complaints about them, right? And so at that point, they might go to an attorney in our consumer group and say, that we're gonna sue this company because it's clear that this is not just Ms. McGillicuddy's problem, but Mr. Johnson, Mr. Jones, Ms. Rodriguez, Ms. Uh, uh, Ahmed, and we're gonna sue. So then, so they usually start as complaints. Then sometimes they ripen into lawsuits when we see that it's not a one-off, but it's actually a, a, a systemic problem. So that's how we, we do that. Sometimes we, um, th we, get, we get cases because other states have said, hey, because I do every Tuesday, I do a call with 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 a group of other uh, attorneys general, and they're like, "Hey, have you seen a problem here? Have you seen a problem there?" And sometimes I go back and I ask my staff, "Have you seen this problem?" And they'll say, "Oh yeah, we got some calls on that." So we might start a multi-state or join one, right? So this is how we do that. I mean, going back to this idea of helping people afford their lives, it seems to me that look. America's greatest invention is its middle class. And if, peop and if, you, and if you can't afford, your, your pay is wrong, your, your, your housing situation is bad, you can't afford your education, pollution is making it so you can't even drink what's coming out of the faucet, how can you afford your life? The attorney general is your family's legal department. And so I prioritize economic sustainability that's what we do it. I'm, I, if you're super rich, I love you and I'm with you, but you don't need me. Let's, right? God bless you. I wish I was rich, right? But if you're rich, you probably don't need to worry about call. But if you are a middle class person, a person on a fixed income, a person who gets a W-2, a, a, you know, you, know you, you may need the attorney general to help you. Now look, if you can afford an in the ground pool, you probably are not poor. But, those, but that's an enormous investment, which those people, most of them, cannot afford to lose. You know, so we, we're standing up for everybody. We sued a, guy, a person who was doing a fraud thing with weddings. And somebody was making fun of me about, oh, you're wasting time on weddings. I'm like, if you are that bride and you've sunk 20 grand into the wedding and somebody's making off with your money, let me tell you, you would see it differently. So. The, the, so, so, so we, we help anybody and everybody, but usually the people we generally help are, are people who are, are trying to thrive in, a, in, a, in what can be a tough economy. We only have a few minutes left. Do you want five minutes? Right. Here's a quick almost a yes or no question we okay. could get out of the way. Somebody wanted to know if there's still any money coming in from the tobacco lawsuits. Yes, there is, absolutely. I think I'm, you know, I'm just, I know the numbers, but I, you know, sometimes I get numbers scrambled in my head. I think we got a $75 million settlement, uh, and it may not all come in at once in that lump sum, but it's coming in back to Minnesota. What happened? I'll even tell folks what happened with the tobacco money. So, you know, we we didn't go in with the multi-state. Skip Humphrey said we're going to sue them, and he did sue them, and he took them to court. And like in the middle of the trial, when the verdict was about to come back. The tobacco company said, uh, we can see the handwriting on the wall. Okay, we're going to pay. So they do, and they cut that deal. And then those companies end up selling off or buying, getting bought, and so the existing company is not owned by the same people. And they didn't realize they had legal obligations to the state of Minnesota and weren't paying us. So we sued them to get our money, and we got it, and we won, and the money's flowing again. Cool. Mm-hmm. 
So interesting. I think we could ask you questions for another hour, but I think we are about out of time. Well, so thank you for having me. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Well, I just really hope that people, you know, support and join the League of Women Voters, whether it's the debates that you all sponsor or whatever you're doing or going show, you know what? Showing up to naturalization ceremonies we to, do that. To, to get <laughs> folks, you know, it's just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful group you guys are, and uh, I thank you for just existing. Please keep it up. And I want to also thank SPNN Studios for hosting and to all of our viewers. We hope today's conversation sheds some light on what the Attorney General does for Minnesotans and what the office is focusing on in 2023. Our next conversation in this series will be with Julie Blaha, the Minnesota State Auditor, and that will be in March. So watch for details on that. Good day and take care, everyone. <laughs>